right, good morning again. It's time for our praise music. If you'll please stand with us for the first two songs. Joy to the world, the same. 
seated for our last song. Well, it is that time in our church service when we will gather or kneel corporately to pray. Um, I just wanted to say, when Dwayne was up making his announcement, he was talking that, mentioning that there were less people here today. Uh, sometimes my students, I'm a high school teacher, and sometimes the students will come in and they'll look around and they'll say, wow, there's nobody here today. And I will look at them and I will say, pardon me, but are you not here today? Am I not here today? Are we nobody? Today is a very special day. This is the only day that's ever going to have this date in history. And you are here and I am here. And I believe that we have a divine appointment to be here today. I invite you to come forward if you'd like to come forward and kneel with me up here as we pray. Or please kneel where you are.
Lord God, each of us kneeling or with our head bowed low before you, Lord, if we think about you and we think about what you have done for us in our life and in the lives of our family, Lord, we are overwhelmed with gratitude, Lord. We are overwhelmed at how you have worked in our life and are continuing to work in our life and will always be working on our behalf, Lord. Even when we were far away from you, it was we who were far away from you, Lord. You were never far away from us. All we have to do is turn our hearts, turn our minds back toward you, Lord, and there you are. And so, Lord, we do that this morning, Lord, each of us in our own way, in our own hearts, Lord. We turn to you this morning, Lord, and we see your glory and we see your majesty, Lord. We, we lift up our thanks, we lift up our praise for who you are and who you continue to be, Lord. You are the everlasting from beginning to end, and our minds can barely just fathom, Lord, how great you are. And so we thank you for that, Lord, and we pray that as we lift up our petitions before you this morning, so many things on our hearts and minds, Lord. There are many of us here who are hurting physically, Lord. Many of us who are hurting spiritually and mentally and emotionally, Lord. We take all those hurts. We give them up to you, Lord. We know that you see them. We give them to you, Lord. We ask for your mercy. We ask that according to your will and your kindness and your timing, Lord, that you would, you would touch us, Lord, and that you would heal us, each one of us, in our own way. Lord, there are family members of, of each of us who are also hurting, people that are out of work, people looking for work. Lord, we pray um, that those who are in that situation where they're needing work, uh, Lord, that you would help them to find something suitable. Lord, it is how you choose to bless us. It is how you provide um, for our food and our lodging, Lord. You give us jobs or whatever you do, Lord. And we just pray those who are seeking that today, um, that you would touch them, Lord, and that you would be with them and help them find them. And last, Lord, we, we pray today during this time of year, uh, there are many people, Lord, who are hurting in an extra special way at this time of year because of strained family relationships, Lord. And I want to lift that up in a special way. I pray that each of us today who has that strained family relationship, Lord, that to the extent that it depends on each one of us that we would reach out and we would try to mend those relationships today, Lord. And to the extent that we need a miracle from you, Lord, for a healing touch, we pray that you would do that, Lord, according to your will, according to your mercy. Lord, we come before you now and we lift all these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. Finding a Christmas song sometimes is a little bit difficult, something that not very many people have heard before, but, you know, sometimes you turn on the radio and you can hear the same songs being played over and over again, and this one was only once a year, right? And so we get to sing about the birth of Jesus Christ and how he is the light of the world, so... Drops of mercy. 
mercy shine bright, shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world, hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Jesus, the light of the world, hail the Son of Righteousness. Jesus, the light of the world, will walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dew drops of mercy shine bright, shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world, will walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dewdrops of mercy shine bright, shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Thank you, John David. That, uh, that is the ultimate understanding, isn't it? Jesus, light, understanding his humanity. And we're going to, we're going to see that is the solution for what we talk about here today. But before we start, let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to grasp the significance of Jesus becoming flesh, of, of, of Jesus becoming a human like us, and how that impacts our day-to-day -day lives. We take this for granted, but there are those who come from different backgrounds and from different religious faiths that once they grasp this idea that it was the creator of the universe, that our very creator came here to become a human and to suffer all the things that we have suffered. It's an amazing thought, and it should transform our lives, and I pray, Lord, that it will. We ask in his name, amen. Where are we? Where are we? That is a question that we need to ask periodically. Would you agree? We need to ask that question periodically. Where are we? We saw there in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, Jesus comes in the cool of the evening, and he's looking for Adam and Eve, and what did he ask Adam? Where are you? Now why is he asking Adam that? Because Adam wasn't at the normal place where they connected. But has there ever been a more loaded question ever asked of humankind than that question that God asked Adam? 6,000 years ago. Where are you? That is a question, as I said, that we need to ask. We need to ask it periodically, and we need to ask it on several different levels. We need to ask it individually. Where am I? We need to ask it as a family. Where is my family? We need to ask it as a congregation. Where are we as a congregation? And we need to ask it as a denomination. Where are we as a denomination? You know, if you look at Genesis 4 as well, and I want to invite you to take a look there because that's not as well known, but it should be familiar to you. Genesis chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 5 through 7. 
And this is God, again, dealing with Cain. Verses 5 through 7, it says, But he did not respect Cain, and the he being God, but he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Now look, look at how God deals with him. He says, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. What is God inviting Cain to do here? Say again. To have victory? Absolutely. What else? Change his attitude? But he's asking him to evaluate himself, isn't he? He's saying, Cain, you need to look at yourself. You need to determine where you're at. Where are you, Cain? Do you want to do good? Or not? Because if you do, good things will happen. If not, bad stuff's going to happen. But is it possible to rule over the sin in our lives? It is possible. That's what he says. Because it say, he says here, but you should rule over it. Now we're going to get to that. The answer to that is like we talked about. It's in the humanity of Jesus. But God is inviting Cain to evaluate where he's at. Where am I? I want to read to you, this is from the book, In Heavenly Places. And this is the devotional for December 21st. So this is yesterday's devotional. I want you to, to ponder this. While it is said, today, today if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. That's from Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 15. Oh, <coughs> excuse me, who will describe to you the lamentations that will arise when at the boundary line which parts time and eternity, the righteous judge will lift up his voice and declare it is too late. Long have the wide gates of heaven stood open and the heavenly messengers have invited and entreated, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart. But at length the mandate go for, goes forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. The heavenly gate closes. The invitation of salvation ceases. In heaven it is said, it is done. Such a time is not far distant. Now, I want to just take a break and help maybe illustrate this a little more. It was mentioned that when I announced that we would be moving, that there was shock. But let me ask you something. Have you ever known a pastor to stay in a church forever? Is it not the way of our denomination that pastors come and go? Then why would that be a shock? Especially given that I'm coming up on seven years. Why would that be a shock? Folks, that, I think there's a tremendous spiritual lesson there. That is, everything that God has said will happen is going to take place. It doesn't mean it will happen right now or tomorrow, but the day is coming when it's going to take place. And the day is coming when what we have just read about will take place and so that's why it's so important that we ask that question where are we let me keep going the world is loaded down with the curse which sin brings it is literally deluged with sin with violence and corruption as in the days of noah and yet, at this fearful period of our world's history, many are asleep. 
They cease to make efforts to become Christians. Honesty, nobility, purity of soul, fellowship with God and angels, the heavenly hope, the eternal inheritance, the joys unspeakable and the bliss immeasurable are your birthright. I'm going to read that again. Honesty, nobility, purity of soul, fellowship with God and angels, the heavenly hope, the eternal inheritance, the joys unspeakable and the bliss immeasurable are your birthright. Folks, that is our right by birth to Jesus. And yet, and yet, here's what it says. And will you barter away these treasures for sinful pleasure? What shall worldly pleasures avail you when all the world shall be overwhelmed as was Sodom and destroyed like Gomorrah? Too late will sinners realize that they have sold their birthright. The crown that they might have had shines upon the brow of another. The inheritance which they might have had is lost. Beware how you trifle with temptation. Beware your boast of your strength. Christ is your everlasting strength. Confide in God. Lay hold of His strength and He will bring you off conqueror and you will wear the crown of victory. Folks, it is so vitally important that each one of us ask that question. Where are we? And that we are honest when God reveals the truth to us. I can't help but think of a pre-flood world. Don't you think it would have done them an awful lot of good in the antediluvian world if they would have said, where are we? Where are we in relation to God? Because if they would have asked that question and sincerely listened for the answer, maybe God wouldn't have had to destroy the whole world by flood. What about Lot? Where am I? You know where I'm at? I'm dead in the middle of this city of sin. Looking at perversion all around me. What am I doing here? Had Lot asked that question seriously and said, Where am I? And he had listened sincerely to the response. He might have got himself up out of there a lot sooner than he did. What about Jacob? Where am I? I'm lying here out in the wilderness with my head on a rock because I have deceived my brother and I have been involved in some pretty awful treachery. Where am I? Judah. You remember the story of Judah? Isn't that an awesome story? Great story of Judah. Where am I? I'm estranged from my family. I've committed some hideous things. Moses. What about Saul? What about David? What about the nation? As we look at the nation of Israel, what about the nation of Israel after the death of Solomon? What happened, folks? What happened to the nation of Israel after the death of Solomon? It split. What would have happened if the people in Israel would have said, Where are we? Where are we as a nation? Here we are, ready to split apart. Brother with brother, sister with sister. We're ready to split apart and become two entirely separate nations. Where are we? You know, folks, I want to just take a moment. I think it's important that we ask this, as I said, individually, as a family, as a congregation, and as a denomination. Where are we as a denomination? We see here after Solomon, the nation split. Where are we as a denomination? Folks, I'll tell you what's happening. There are many, many things happening, but I can tell you right now, we're ready to rip ourselves apart over things like the ordination of women. 
and also the desire that we're going to do whatever we want to do, regardless of what the world church says. There's a lot of things brewing within the house of God in our denomination. Folks, let me tell you something else is where we're at. Far too many of us in the church are attaching ourselves to the political climate and the culture around us, and we're becoming involved with that, and we're going to tear ourselves apart based on that. Where are we? Where are we? Let me just make this statement before ultimately we realize that the answer is in the humanity of Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to get to because that's the most important thing. But it is important for us to, to stop and look at ourselves and say, where are we? As I said, we're beginning to tear ourselves apart for all kinds of things. And yet, I wish we could understand this. And this is one thing that I think the military experience has, has, has helped me to understand. Is that you realize, folks, when you, are, when you are in combat, do you care about all of those things as it relates to the man in the foxhole with you in that fighting hole? Do you care? No. You want to know that he has your back. You know that he's a human being like you that has all the same struggles. He's desperately trying to stay alive. Folks, every single one of us is a target of the devil. Every single one of us is a target of the enemy, and he's not just trying to take us out quietly. That would be bad enough. But he's trying to ruin us, make us miserable, and destroy us in the process. He wants to make it hurt while he takes us out. Like some kind of mafia interrogation. He wants to make it hurt. That's what the enemy is trying to do to all of us. If we come to see Jesus... And if we come to realize that each one of us is fighting this battle and that we all have a common enemy, I think it would help us in a lot of ways. You know, I, I want to share this, I think, because, and, and, and hopefully you can understand, even those of you who may not be acquainted with it, um, because it, I think it helps to illustrate something. But just recently, I was just, I was just, I caught a, a short YouTube clip of, it was a, a, a talk show, and it was in relation recently to something that took place in the National Football League, and that's why I say you may not be aware of it, and not necessarily that you should be aware of it, but there was a particular player who has stepped away from the game he has decided he's kind of quit, if you will, because of a couple of issues. One, he has a, a chemical addiction and he's got some mental health issues. But I, as I watched a former player, in fact, the former player's name is Chris Carter. You guys may, may not know who he is. It doesn't really matter. He's in the Hall of Fame. But I was touched by how he spoke about this other individual because he too shared how he had struggled with chemical addiction and just the anguish that he spoke about this was was you could feel it but it struck me because folks the reality is how many of us have really a whole lot in common with an NFL player not much right not much. We don't have a whole lot in common with them. So we think. And yet here's a young man who's struggling with his very existence and his own health. He's struggling with the same issues that, that you and I struggle with. Every single one of us is facing these same kinds of issues that we deal with day to day. Is that right? Am I speaking, am I speaking truth or am I, am I fake news? Am I, folks, is, is that right? 
It doesn't matter who you are. You are dealing with so many of the same things day by day. And you know what it boils down to? Is that you are dealing with Satan's attempts to destroy you. Folks, look at the brother and the sister on either side of you here this morning. You need them and they need you. I realize we need Christ, but we need each other. Where are we? Where are we as, as individuals? Where are we as a people? Now, here is the thing that, that occurs. As we seriously ask that question, and as we begin to ponder that question, that can be a very fragile moment, right? If we come to see ourselves as we truly are, that can be a tough thing. Because when we begin to realize the darkness that rests in our own hearts, that can be overwhelmingly discouraging. In fact, I take you to Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. As we think about our own characters, as we think about what our hearts are like. Because remember, remember Jeremiah also says, Jeremiah also says that the heart is what? Help me out, guys. It's deceitful and wicked, right? The heart is deceitful and wicked. So when we come face to face with our hearts, we have to look at what the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 13, 23. It says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. Now, the description here that God is sending to His people, is this something that is very difficult to do or something that is impossible to do? <coughs> the point is, it's impossible. And folks, when we begin to look at our own hearts and we begin to evaluate and we begin to ask that question, where am I? Where are we? We're going to see some ugly things. Right? We're going to see some ugly things. And when we see those ugly things, we're also going to realize that we're just as powerless as the leopard or the Ethiopian. We're just as powerless as anybody to make the changes of that ugly stuff that we see in our own hearts. That's where this season comes in. Right? Because there is an answer. The answer is a creator who says, not only will I forgive you, but I'm going to do something radical. I'm going to become a human being. I'm going to become like you. And I'm going to go through everything that you go through. I'm going to tell you something. I have, I really have taken that for granted. And I think we in the church, those of us who have grown up in the faith, have come to take that for granted. And I'll tell you what helped me to really understand that was I recently read a book. I gave a copy of it to our church board. It's called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And let me tell you something, folks. When you hear the story of this young Muslim man, when it finally dawns on him, when he finally fully grasps the idea that Allah actually came to this earth, became a human, and died for him, it was powerful. It was powerful. And as I read his account of that, I said, God, I need to have that same kind of impact in my heart, because I've gotten way too gospel hardened. I don't appreciate that the way this young man has come to appreciate it. Jesus came as a human being. Do you realize what that means for us? Do you realize that right now at the, in the courts of heaven is a human being? 
a human. I don't know how I don't know how else to kind of put that into context, um, except to maybe think about our own history in America. And let's let's go back let's go back say to the to the eighteen hundreds late eighteen hundreds. And you're a black man in the eighteen hundreds, and you've just been arrested. Now, what does what does our Constitution promise a man? It says you can have a trial by what? Your peers, right? So here's this young man. He's got to face the judicial system, and he looks up at the jury box. And it's all a bunch of white faces staring back at him. How do you think he feels? <laughs> now, let's change that scenario a little bit. He stares up at that jury box, the people that are going to decide his fate, and he sees all black faces staring back at him. Do you see where, do you see where I'm headed with this? Why does, that make, why does that make him feel different? Because he knows that the people there that are going to be deciding his fate understand exactly what his life has been like, right? Folks, that's the same thing. It's the only way I can. That may be a feeble way to try and explain it, but it's the only way that I can begin to understand to help us grasp the significance of the fact that we have a human being who sits at the court of heaven in the universe. Now, let me read something else to you, because this is fascinating to me, and it's a thought I've never quite caught before. But Jesus who came, and it tells us in Hebrews, it says that Jesus was made in all ways like as we are. It says that He was tempted in all ways like as we are. Let me read this to you. This comes from... <coughs> Come from the book Our High Calling, page 361. The Savior knows what is best. Faith grows by conflict with doubt and difficulty and trial. Now, isn't that amazing? Actually, when we wrestle with doubt, that can have the ability to strengthen our faith. Don't be afraid of the trial in life. If you ask, where am I, as a result, and you listen to the answer, God can take that and make the best out of it, right? That's right. Because remember, God is the only one who can make chicken salad out of chicken poo. I try to make that family friendly here for church. But He is the only one. And He can do it. It says, don't, your faith grows by conflict with doubt and difficulty and trial. Virtue gathers strength by resistance to temptation. The life of the faithful soldier is a battle and a march. No rest, fellow pilgrim, this side of the heavenly Canaan. We've got to understand that we're not going to get a rest until we get to heaven. There is no rest until we enter into the heavenly Canaan. Until then, it's going to be a march and a struggle. That's why we need each other. Folks, it's so much easier to march when you've got people marching in step with you. Right, Aaron? It's so much easier when you've got a whole other troop of people marching in step with you. But John, in holy vision, beholds the faithful souls that come up out of great tribulation, surrounding the throne of God, clad in white robes, and crowned with immortal glory. What though they have been counted the off-scouring of the earth? In the investigative judgment, their lives and characters are brought in review before God. Remember that jury box we talked about? All of us are sitting there facing judgment. And that solemn tribunal reverses the decision of their enemies. Their faithfulness to God and to His Word stands revealed, and heaven's high honors are awarded them as conquerors in the strife with sin and Satan. Now, this is the one thing I never thought about before. Listen to this. 
It says, in the investigative judgment, their lives and characters are brought in review before God, and that solemn tribunal reverses the decision of their enemies. Have you ever thought of the investigative judgment and the courts of heaven reversing the accusations against you? I, I, I just, it, that hit me in a way that I've never ever thought of it before. You and I have been drug into court. Now, unfortunately for many who have been drug into earthly courts, they've been drugged there unjustly, correct? But in this case, that's not how it is. Because the reality is, is there are countless accusations against each one of us that are absolutely true. They are true and they are right. But because of what Jesus did, and here's what I want to just take a moment for us to consider. Why did Jesus come, be born of the DNA of a woman, and live his life at every stage of life? Infant, toddler, child, adolescent, adult. Couldn't Jesus have accomplished the sacrifice by just showing up at about the age of 25 or whatever? Shows up one weekend, dies, that satisfies the sacrifice. That satisfies the requirement of the death of the Son of God. Couldn't he have done that? Well, I don't know. That's, that's speculation. I don't know. All I know is that what he did do was he came as a human being and he lived out every stage of human life. That means something significant. That means that the sin that you struggle with, the pain that you struggle with, the suffering you struggle with, the injustice that you may struggle with, whatever it is in your life, Jesus went through it and He said, I can take that into my own soul and nail it to the cross. And so that in this great judgment, I can reverse the accusation of your enemy. And the reason that I can do that is because I've come and I've walked in your shoes. I've walked where you've walked. I've lived where you've lived. I've experienced what you've experienced. I have felt it all. And I've overcome it. That is why I am able to replace your record with my record and that's why I'm able, when you stand there in chains before that tribunal, I can say, he is mine. Look at the record. It's perfect. Take the chains off this man and let him go. The reason is because he became a human. You know, again, I'm going to refer to this book, Seeking Allah finding Jesus, because that's one of the things that this young man had trouble with. He had to wrestle through. How is it that another man can pay the penalty for another man's sins? That's not fair and that's not right. Only the Son of God, right, could pay the penalty for everybody? But not just the Son of God, the Son of God who's gone through all the experiences that we've gone through. That's what allows Him to be able to do what He is willing to do in our hearts and characters. That's why it's our birthright. is because a human being, just as human as you and me, came and walked on this earth, went through it, He now gives it to us. It is our birthright to live in eternity. But the question is, where are you?
please stand with us for our closing hymn. It's hymn number 143, Silent Night. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. awesome gift it is that that you came to this earth that is so unique we sang about it during our praise songs what what king has ever left his throne to live as a as a as a peasant as the lowest in society but that's what you did lord my prayer is this is that each one of us we've known this we've read about it we may have known about it all our life but but Lord, help us to begin to grasp the significance of this, as did that young Muslim man, as he came to realize that the God that he served actually came to this earth and became a human so that he could give us victory over sin, so that his victory over the temptations and the sins and the and the the misery and the suffering of this world could be overcome in our lives as well because of what He did. Lord, my prayer is that, that each one of us will experience this in a way we've never experienced before. Let this holiday season be a time that touches us like never before. Let Jesus become real to us like never before. And then our lives will become more significant and meaningful like they haven't before. And I ask all this because of Jesus. Amen.